for our meditation today, we're going to look at Psalm 39. Psalm 39. It's probably not a psalm with which we're terribly familiar. It wouldn't be classed as one of the most popular of the psalms, like Psalm 23, for example, Psalm 121. <coughs> and unlike many of the psalms, there's no occasion given for the writing of Psalm 39. We don't know what situation the psalmist was in. We don't know why he wrote it. We don't know where he wrote it. But it seems likely that it's a sequel to Psalm 38. That's why I read Psalm 38 uh, earlier. The psalmist in Psalm 38 seems to be in great distress. Something is happening. He seems to be in agony, both in body and in mind. If you look at verses 1 to 8, let me just remind you of some of what it says. Oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your wrath, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure, for your arrows pierce me deeply, and your hand presses me down. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your anger, nor any health in my bones because of my sin. So he's in great distress. He says, I am feeble and severely broken. I groan because of the turmoil of my heart. And it's good we have these kind of things in the Psalms because quite often we go through similar kind of circumstances. When we are in distress, we don't know which way to turn, we don't know what is happening, and we don't know why it's happening. In Psalm 39, the psalmist is still in distress, suffering great anxiety of soul as he considers and thinks about his own situation. So let's delve into this psalm a little bit in Psalm 39. And the first thing that we see is the conflict in his mind. The conflict in his mind. And we break that down into several parts. So first of all, he makes a determined resolution. As he reflects on his life and his present situation, probably thinking about all that he'd been going through, it may have been a period of ill health, it may simply have been the opposition of his enemies, the mockery of his enemies, and perhaps it was, as he mentions, God's chastisement on him because of his own sin. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your anger, nor any health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. And when he thinks about these things, he makes certain resolutions. He resolves, first of all, to be careful about his conduct. I said, I will guard my ways. Now, this is the kind of resolution that every child of God should make every day. Every day when we wake up, we should make this same resolution. I will guard my ways. We should resolve in our minds each day that we will guard our ways. In private, where no one sees us. At home, in our relationships with our family. At work when we are likely to be in the company of unbelievers. Because we have a nature that is sinful, and because the devil goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, it is necessary to keep David's resolution very much in mind. Think about this. 
When we sin, we dishonor God. When we sin, we dishonor God. So let's make the same kind of resolution that David did. I will guard, I will be careful about my conduct. But David added something to it. He said he would be especially careful with regard to his tongue. There is no way in which we are more likely to sin than with our words. James says, if anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. It is so easy to be careless or thoughtless with regard to the use of our tongue. <coughs> and the Bible tells us just how important it is to control our tongue. Proverbs 13.3 says, He who guards his mouth preserves his life. But he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Psalm 34 verse 13, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. And then we have words from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He says, for by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. I wonder if we're to think back over the past week and we apply that to what came out of our mouths this last week. I wonder where we would stand. And the book that has the most extensive warning about the use of the tongue is the book of James, especially chapter 3, which is why I read it earlier on. Let's have a look for a moment at what he says. He says... Those who teach must be especially careful. Those who minister the word in any capacity or those who teach the word are to be particularly watchful about how and what they say. So those who are ministers, elders, Sabbath school teachers, in whatever capacity we teach, we are to be particularly careful. And James tells us that the tongue is notoriously difficult to control and therefore requires more diligent care than other members of the body. And he says, as a small thing, a small start spark can start a huge fire. We know how we, we have these, these forest fires. And very often, they're started by a match. They're started by something very, very small, and they cause enormous destruction. And think about the tongue as a fire. Fire is painful. You know what it's like when you burn yourself. It hurts. So are the burns caused by hot words. How often have people been burned by the words that somebody else has spoken? And they don't go away. We remember them and remember them and remember them. Fire spreads. So does gossip and evil speaking. If we use our tongue unwisely, it may be just to one person, but then it spreads to someone else and someone else, and it spreads far and wide. So fire is painful, fire spreads, and fire consumes. 
Just so, careless words consume character. How many people's character has been destroyed by unwise words that someone has spoken? And I suppose in the generation in which we live, words spread not just by the spoken word, but by social media. How many people's lives have been destroyed by social media? Not speaking the truth, but speaking lies. And the thing that ought to most rebuke the child of God is what James says in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 3. With it, that's it, our tongue, we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. It's ridiculous, isn't it? That we, we come here and we sing praise to God. We use our mouth to use these glorious words of adoration and praise. And then we go out of the place and we use our tongue unwisely to injure and harm or destroy another person's character. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. David was so aware of the danger that his words could do that he determined to curb it with a bridle. The tongue of the believer can be guided, directed and curbed. How? Only by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. We have a bridle in the scripture. We have a bridle in the operation of the Holy Spirit who <coughs> controls and directs our speech. David was particularly careful when in the presence of wicked men. This is so important, especially when facing adverse circumstances. It's so easy to say unwise or hasty things that can ruin or destroy our testimony. You see, if we, if we use our tongue unwisely with people who are not believers, they will remember that and they won't remember the hundreds of good things that you say but they will remember the one adverse, cruel, or hasty thing that you say. And these things bring shame on the cause of Christ. David did not want to be guilty of giving his enemies ammunition to use against him or against his God. And so he resolves to be completely silent so strong was his fear of sinning with his tongue that he went even further than necessary. It could be said that his silence was commendable. We remember how the Lord Jesus Christ was silent before his accusers. And there are occasions when it's better to say nothing. That being said, take, <coughs> taking the decision to hold his peace even from good was perhaps not the right thing to do. Matthew Henry comments, the same law which forbids all corrupt communication requires that which is good and to the use of edifying. Ephesians 4.29 Let no corrupt words proceed out of your mouth but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. And then we look at the conflict caused in his mind. David determined to write his tongue and remain silent, but
but whilst his tongue was bridled, his thoughts were not. It is not absolutely clear what the psalmist was musing about. It may have been the situation that he faced. It may have been the anger of his enemies. <clears throat> it may, may simply be the fact that he did not seem to have the sense of God's presence with him. He may even have had a sense of futility, wondering if there was any purpose in his life. There were many thoughts going around in his head, and he determined to be silent. But such was his concern and anxiety that was building up within him, like a fire, and he couldn't contain these, these emotions within himself. He said, I'm going to keep quiet, but then these things kept bubbling up, they kept, they kept occupying my mind, and I, I couldn't hold it in. And then in verses 4 to 6, we have the consequences of this conflict. It is very significant that when the psalmist does speak, it's not to man, neither to his brethren or his companions or the ungodly. He turns to God. He turns to God. Verse 3 says, my heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue, Lord, make me to know my end and the measure of my days. It was to God that he spoke. And the request he made may seem on the surface to be rather strange. But on reflection, it is very wise and important. He says, Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am. <coughs> we mustn't think that this prayer meant that David was seeking death or even to know the timing of it. That's not the point. He simply wanted to have a proper awareness of it. I want you to think about that. Maybe when you get to my age, you begin to think of death a lot more than when you're younger. But so many people live as, as though they're going to live forever with no thought whatsoever for what lies ahead of them. They plan for the future as though the future was in their own hands. James makes a comment on this foolish attitude when he says in chapter 4 and verses 13 and 14, Come now! You who say today or tomorrow will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. And there are a number of lessons we can learn from David's prayer. First of all, a reminder of the shortness of life. Death is the end for both righteous and unrighteous alike. We may not like to think about it, but it is an ever-present reality. The only breath of which we can be certain is the one that we take now. Not one of us can guarantee how long we have on this earth. Such a knowledge should concentrate the mind on eternal realities beyond this life. You see, we need to remember this. The time of death is fixed in the counsel of Almighty God. 
Hebrews 9 verse 27. It is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. And the Shorter Catechism reminds us that we have to be careful with the lives that God has given us. The Sixth Commandment requireth all lawful endeavours to preserve our own life and the life of others. We need to constantly remind ourselves that the time of our passing is not in the hands of men, but of God. Do we ever think about that? I sometimes thank God that he's given me such a long life and I'm thankful for it. I'm reluctant at my stage in life to take preaching appointments a long time in the future. I don't know how much longer I have. I thank God for the years that he has given me. But we need to remind ourselves that death is constantly working in us. The corruption caused by sin is being manifested each succeeding day in sickness and in weakness and in measures of frailty. We're not as we were 10, 20 years ago. The body becomes weaker. We don't have the energy that once we did. Our life is measured as a hand's breadth. The shortest measure in the scripture. That's how our life is measured. We may live 70, 80, 90 years. We have a lady in our congregation in Newton Arts and she celebrated her 100th birthday just recently. And she's still out every Sabbath morning at worship. How long do we have? We don't know. The shortest measure is enough to reckon the lifespan of man. It's a hand breadth. It's not even a span. It's a hand breadth. It is nothing in the light of eternity. And then in verses 5 and 6, he gives us a reminder of the vanity of life. And a secular definition of vanity is having an excessive pride in one's looks, appearance, status, or abilities compared to that of others. However, the biblical use of the word indicates emptiness, uselessness, or nothingness. And the psalmist here says, the man is at best nothing more than a vapor that quickly passes away. Nothing in this life is substantial or durable. It's what Solomon was dealing with in Ecclesiastes, in that well-known phrase, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. David here outlines this emptiness in different ways. He says, first, his worldly joy and honour is vain. Honour, success in this life is vain. It can come quickly and it can disappear just as quickly. David reminds us that every man, rich or poor, wise or foolish, are in the same category. And at best, in the full vigour of youth, or at the height of their power and influence are nothing but a vapour, insubstantial and fading. People are so easily moved in their emotional state by the shifting circumstances of life. When we are appreciated or commended for something that we have done, the world seems to be a pleasant place. When someone says, well done, you did a good job, your chest begins to swell and you think that's great. Everything is okay with the world. But when we are criticized or condemned, even when we have done no wrong, 
everything seems to be dark and horrible. His worrying, says the psalmist, is in vain. He cannot change much of what he worries about. Matthew 6, 27. Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Some people are prone to worry. And I'm afraid I count myself as one of those. I worry about things. I try not to, but I do. I worry that when I'm driving to Letterkenny, I'll take the wrong road. Yeah. Or that something will happen. Something will happen with the car. And I worry and I think about it. And sometimes, I must confess, it takes sleep away from me. I worry about it at night. I've tried to overcome it, but some people are very prone to worry. They worry about the economy, the state of the country. And of course, these are things that Christians should pray about. But to worry about them is futile. I can't change what's going to happen. And David speaks of the gathering of riches is vain. David speaks of those who toil to amass riches and do not know who will gather them. And the same kind of sentiments are expressed by Solomon in Ecclesiastes. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed, all is vanity and grasping for the wind. What a great picture when you get the wind blowing and you try and get hold of it. You can't. And that's, that's how the, the, the Bible describes this uh, longing for things. Again, he says in Ecclesiastes 2 and 11, Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done, and on the labour in which I had toiled. And indeed, all was vanity and grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. The final thing I want us to look at is the conclusion of his conflict in verses 7 to 13. As the psalmist reflects on the brevity and the vanity of life, it is perhaps no surprise that he then turns his thoughts to God and to the delights and comforts that can only be found in him. It is a sad fact that when the pleasures of the world begin to pull, so many people have no recourse but to seek more or different pleasures or to fall into depression or despair. They do not realize or even wish to know that the only solution to the emptiness of life is to be found in God. When all the pleasures of this life begin to pour, the only solution, the only recourse that we have is in God. And David expresses that in his confidence in God. He says, what do I wait for? The implication being, that there is nothing that the world had to offer that was worth waiting for. It was all vanity anyway. With this understanding, he then acknowledged that his only real hope was in God. The world and all it has to offer is empty and vain. The only place to find solutions, comfort and assurance is the God who is eternal and unchanging. And we need to ask ourselves the question. We all have different circumstances in our life. We all face 
different problems. Where is your confidence? Is your confidence in your own ability? Is your confidence in what you have? What perhaps you worked for? Or is your confidence only in God? But then he speaks of his commitment to God. When he, when he turns to God, he is silent before him because he recognizes that all that was taking place in his life was in the hand of the living God who has done all things well. There's a simple acknowledgement that he makes. It was you who did it. It was you who did it. Do you sometimes complain about your second circumstances? The situation in which you find yourself? You need to remember it was God who did it. It was the Lord who did it. He chooses out our circumstances for us. The indispensable requirement for all those who would wish to be submissive to the word and the will of God. There's something that happened in the scripture in the book of Samuel. You remember about Samuel. Samuel was taken to live in the temple with Eli. Eli brought him up. And he went to bed one night and he heard a voice. And he got up and he went to see Eli. And he said, you called me. Eli said, no, I didn't. Go back to bed. He went back to bed. And the voice called again. And he ran and spoke to Eli. Eli said, no, I didn't call you. Three times that happened. And then finally, Eli realized that God was calling Samuel. And he gave him a message. In the morning, Eli said to Samuel, what did God say to you? What was the message that God gave you? And Eli, or rather Samuel, didn't want to tell him. After all, this man had looked after him, he cared for him, he'd been like a parent to him. And the message was a bad one for Eli. And eventually, Samuel told him that Eli was going to be punished by God for failing to discipline his sons. A serious judgment of God was to come upon him. And then you have the words of Eli. He says this, It is the Lord. Let him do as seems good to him. Let him do what seems good to him. And when adverse circumstances happen in our lives, we should be like Eli. It is the Lord. Let him do as seems good to him. David prays to God. He asks God to remove the plague from him. But he is aware that one of the purposes of chastisement is that the believer is brought afresh to understand his own mortality. The final thing that we see is that he prays that God would give him strength to live for him. He describes himself as a stranger and a sojourner. And the Bible is full of references and examples of the people of God being sojourners in Egypt, in the wilderness, and in 1 Peter 2 and 11, we read, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. And that should be for the Christian, the constant realization 
that this world and the things of this world are alien to him. For this world is not his home, neither is it his inheritance. I want to close with the words of a man called Robert Hawker. He wrote a, a small book on the sand. And he says this, have we ever lifted the earnest supplication like him unto God for grace so as to number our days as to apply our hearts unto wisdom? Have we so counted ourselves for strangers and sojourners upon the earth as like sojourners only to make Christ our home our resting place, our one and only pursuit, our one and only desire. That's what David did. That's what we should do.